Government Operations Subcommittee look at the President's recently announced health care initiatives and how the proposals will require significant financial commitments by state and local governments. You will hear from General Accounting Office officials and representatives from city, county, and state governmental organizations as they assess the financial ability of localities to pay for health care and welfare reform. Chairing the proceedings is Congressman Adolphus Towns, Democrat from New York. Committee on Government Operations and Human Resources and Intergovernmental Relations hearing will come to order. The hearing is on the financial ability of states and local governments to implement health and welfare reform. Last year, House Majority Leader Richard Gephardt asked the General Accounting Office to study the financial conditions of state and local governments. At today's hearing, the Majority Leader will release the results of that report. The subcommittee will examine the implications of the GAO report for state and local governments. In view of the administration's health care reform proposal and soon to be released welfare reform package, each of these initiatives will require large expenditures of funds by state and local governments. Over the last 10 years, many state and local governments have experienced an unprecedented loss of revenue, particularly in major urban areas. Several recessions and the exodus of businesses and middle-class taxpayers have further reduced revenue growth. Simultaneously, there has been an increasing demand of social programs at a time when the federal government has reduced its level of funding to states and local governments. These conditions could spell disaster for health and welfare reform. The American Health Security Act will create a sweeping array of new duties for the 50 states. Under the administration's proposal, states assume primary responsibility for ensuring that all eligible individuals have access to a health plan that delivers the nationally guaranteed comprehensive benefit package. For example, each state must establish health alliances and qualify health plans to participate in alliances. Each state establishes a mechanism to assess the quality of health plans. Their financial stability and capacity to deliver these comprehensive benefit packages. States must also have an agency that assumes control of a failed plan. In view of their shrinking resources, Congress must assess whether the states have the money and the flexibility to implement this major initiative. I'm concerned that the President's health care plan, while reducing expenditures at the state level over the next 10 years, will put the major burden on the states in the short run. We must also assess whether states like New York, which make substantial financial commitments to service in the poor, will be adequately compensated under the new proposal. The existing Medicaid program has failed to distinguish between the different needs and physical pressures that states must confront, and New York has suffered tremendously. The Clinton proposal must also end the two-tiered system of health care that has failed to meet the health needs of the poor, racial minorities, and women, and does not provide states with the flexibility and resources to meet those needs. Currently, our underserved communities have second-rate health care with no real access to the primary and preventative services. The current plan creates barriers to such access, such as requiring co-payments by the poor before receiving health care, which could undermine the entire proposal. I'm also concerned that poor women may not have access to necessary mammograms, pap tests, and other preventative health services. Unless we address these inequities, the proposal will have failed to achieve the principle of equal choice. Congress and the administration must devise strategies to ensure that every city, state, and county has the highest quality of health and welfare reform without having to reduce 
other essential services. I would like to yield now to Mr. Micah from Florida. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I uh, want to uh, welcome the uh, distinguished uh, majority leader here today. Uh, I'm pleased that uh, you uh, sought this, uh, this uh, review of uh, the impact of what we do with uh, health care proposal uh, in the Congress and its impact particularly on uh, local governments. Uh, uh, having spent some time in local governments and we have uh, one of our distinguished uh, commissioners who's from Florida, uh, Barbara Todd, uh, uh, sitting just behind you. Uh, uh, I spent four years in local government and, and I've always been concerned that uh, local government is uh, uh, has always had uh, the direct responsibility for services. Uh, state government has had the uh, very often the authority and uh, federal government uh, has provided the, the uh, uh, mandates. And uh, uh, this, this has placed a tremendous burden on uh, local governments. Uh, they already are providing uh, health care and uh, indigent services and uh, direct services uh, to the people. So. Uh, that, that is a major concern to me. Just as we arrived yesterday, I had uh, a uh, resolution from the Seminole County Commission, Seminole County is just above Orlando, and those commissioners expressed uh, concern in, in a resolution to uh, myself and other members of Congress about the impact of federal mandates. Uh, also, since we've been here, we have imposed additional mandates. Uh, family and medical leave has some uh, impositions on local government, on small business, uh, and uh, that is, that's a major concern that we pass and don't fund uh, directives to uh, local government. And uh, so now, now comes uh, the question of health care costs and how they're absorbed. So uh, I'm anxious to, to hear the results of, uh, of what you've learned. I commend the uh, chairman for uh, holding this hearing and uh, welcome uh, the input that we have from uh, you and the other witnesses. Thank you very much, Thank Congressman you. Micah. We've been joined this morning by our colleague Gary Conant of California, who chairs the Subcommittee on Information, Justice, and Agriculture and Transportation. Congressman Conant uh, 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 has been a long-standing member of, uh, in, in, in terms of making certain that uh, when it comes to uh, dealing with problems that our counties and our states and, uh, and, and cities have. He's uh, also served as a mayor of a city, so he's been very close to this situation. Uh, Gary Condon. Thank you, sir. Uh, first of all, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like to uh, commend you for holding this hearing and uh, allowing me to set in on the panel today. I appreciate that very much. And I'm very pleased to be a part of what I understand to be a series of hearings that will examine the impact of unfunded federal mandates on states, counties, and cities. This is an uh, issue is, uh, in my opinion, the most crucial aspect of the health care welfare and the reform proposal before us today. Uh, there will be significant costs involved as we enact these and other reforms. Uh, these costs cannot and should not be shifted to our states, counties, and cities. We at the federal level of government must take responsibility for the reforms we pass and how they will affect communities across this nation. To begin with, uh, we must stop the practice of passing legislation and then requiring uh, uh, local governments to pay the cost in implementing the federal legislation. As the General Accounting Office reports that it is being, that's being released today demonstrates cities, counties, and states cannot afford to pay federal bills. It is unfair to communities that do not have adequate health, welfare, housing, criminal justice, and safety services. While unfunded federal mandates are not the only cost impacting state, local governments, they are a problem created by the federal government and one that the federal government can correct and we should correct. The ranking Republican member of the full committee, Mr. Klinger and I, are co-chairmen of the Unfunded Federal Mandate Caucus, which has 67 members, which is a bipartisan group. Vice President Gore's National Performance Review recommended that the President should issue a directive limiting the use of unfunded mandates by the administration. The NPR also recommends that Congress should refrain from passing legislation if it 
does not provide the, provide the funds to pay for achieving that legislative goal. Mr. Chairman, I'm deeply committed to working very closely with you and with the majority leader and the administration to make these critical reforms. And I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Thank you very much. It's a delight to have you with us. Uh, let me move forward. It is a, indeed an honor to present a man who needs no introduction to this subcommittee, the majority leader of this House, uh, the Honorable Richard Gephardt. Throughout his distinguished career, the majority leader has championed the cause of state and local governments. The report he is releasing today is the second in a series of the financial conditions of state and local governments. Mr. Leader, it is an honor to have you before this committee. We have your prepared statement, which we will include every page and every word in the record. Uh, please proceed as you wish. Thank like you, Mr. Chairman you. and uh, members of the committee. I'm very pleased to be here. I highly commend you for having these hearings. I think this is a very important subject as we enter into a discussion of uh, health care reform and welfare reform. Uh, clearly, if you talk to any local public official or any state government official in your states, as I know you do on a frequent basis, you are always met with the question of whether or not we are conducting a proper policy in the federal government with regard to mandates. There is a continual complaint by state and local officials that they are asked to do things in terms of public policy and that they are not provided with sufficient funds from the federal government to carry some of those things out. I was a local city council person in St. Louis for five years before I ran for the Congress. I maintain a close relationship with all of the people that I worked with at the local level. I have many other local governments, as all of you do, in my district, and I talk to them regularly about this whole set of problems. A couple of years ago, our country was in the depths of a double-dip recession. In the face of economic downturn and fiscal contraction, lawmakers at the federal level struggled with an increasing deficit and increasing demands for services by Americans who were bearing the brunt of a recession. Certainly, the national recession and federal policies had an impact on state and local governments which were experiencing fiscal difficulties of their own. And as the state and local fiscal situation worsened, we at the federal level began to search for solutions to very real problems. There was no reliable aggregate information on the breadth and depth of the problems facing local and state governments. In September of 1991, I requested the General Accounting Office to conduct an in-depth study of the fiscal condition of state and local governments in order to identify the sources and implications of these problems on national and local levels. The fiscal condition of our state and local governments is absolutely critical to our nation's economic health. This summer, we took a major step toward restoring our strength by enacting the President's Deficit Reduction Plan. In order to continue on the road to economic recovery, we've got to address the impediments to economic growth at the state and local level. I think all of us are aware of the strain that health care spending puts on federal, state, and, and family budgets. Until we can figure out how to decrease health care's share of government spending, we cannot seize control of our economic destiny. Another key component to encourage and facilitate economic growth in states and localities is enabling all levels of government to operate more effectively and efficiently. This GAO report gives real insight to the capacity of state and local government to implement new policy reforms and deliver services. Now, in this report, uh, it was said that in 1989 the nation suffered slow economic growth and a corresponding recession. These factors resulted in increased spending for social safety net programs and, frankly, reduced revenues at all levels of government. The report indicated that spending pressures also increased due to new federal and state government mandates and policy decisions 
as well as runaway health care costs. In contrast, the report says revenues were held down by the recession, decreasing federal grants to states and localities, as well as local and state voter reluctance to increase taxes. And I might add voter reluctance at the federal level to increase taxes. <laughs> These competing forces, the report says, made it increasingly difficult for state and local governments to meet all of their responsibilities. Consequently, state revenue burdens on personal income increased, and both state and local governments cut programs and payrolls in order to reduce spending. These efforts took a toll on the short-term budgetary condition of state and local governments. And while most jurisdictions had amassed budgetary surpluses in the, in the early part of the 80s, they rapidly drew down their surpluses and some fell into deficit positions. These declining surpluses, and in some cases new deficits, have decreased the flexibility of state and local governments to meet the increasing social needs of their constituents. Despite declining budgetary surpluses, however, other short-term budget indicators such as cash and security holdings and debt remain stable or improve for the majority of jurisdictions. The GAO has surmised that the short-term budget condition of state and local governments may improve as our national economy improves or as our fiscal policy is adjusted to relieve contrary spending and revenue pressures. At the federal level, we've already begun to take steps to relieve these pressures. As Vice President Gore recognized in the National Performance Review Report, we must consider the fiscal implications at all levels of government in our deliberations on federal public policy initiatives that will be implemented at the state and local level. President Clinton's health care program will be good news, in my view, for state budgetary problems. States will no longer face open-ended liability for runaway, runaway health care costs. Once we enact health care reform, cost containment measures will limit health care spending to a predictable level that is below current spending predictions. Rather than pushing costs onto state government, the federal government will stand as the guarantor for unanticipated growth, our runaway growth in the system. The GAO also examined the long-term fiscal capacity of state and local jurisdictions <coughs> to provide a basic level of public services given their individual socioeconomic composition. The disparity between state fiscal capacities declined over the past 20 years, mostly due to improved conditions in the poorest states. However, the GAO confirmed that a wide disparity between cities' ability to provide an average level of services. The weakest cities in our country are plagued by deterioration of the industrial base and middle-class flight to surrounding suburbs, leaving mismatched high social spending needs and low tax base. These cities, which are prevalent in the Midwest and Northeast, need outside aid equal to show 36% of their revenue base to be able to provide only average levels of services to their residents. Without this help, these jurisdictions are going to be forced to levy heavy tax burdens on inner city res residents who are the least able to afford it. And to make matters worse, a number of these cities are experiencing short-term budgetary problems which constrain their ability to strengthen their long-term fiscal capacity. This nexus of long and short-term budgetary problems in some of our central cities prevents, presents a very serious dilemma for our country. Lawmakers at all levels of government must work together to develop targeted policies that will reverse the syst systemic trend that plagues these urban areas eliminating duplicative and cumbersome administrative and regulatory requirements I think is essential to this effort. We must be able to coordinate and direct government assistance. To that end, I support the Local Flexibility Act sponsored by the Government Operations Committee Chairman Conyers 
and ranking member Klinger, which would give local governments and private not-for-profit organizations the flexibility to propose integrated plans for more efficient and effective use of federal assistance. I, and I know you, are deeply concerned about the fiscal plight of our nation's urban areas, and I intend to propose a comprehensive legislative agenda to facilitate economic growth and combat the forces that limit the fiscal capacity of these jurisdictions. Certainly, we must not leave these cities behind, as America's economy is only as strong as its weakest link. As we in the Congress formulate federal policy, we've got to be mindful of both short-term and long-term constraints on state and local governments and work better to integrate federal, state, and local government efforts. I commend the Human Resources and Intergovernmental Relations Subcommittee and you, Chairman Towns, for your great efforts to facilitate the dialogue between these governments. And I thank you very much for having this hearing today to direct attention to these problems, to direct attention at what I think is a good report by the General Accounting Office, and I will cooperate with you and the members of this committee in any way that I can to help move us in a positive direction to solve these problems. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for your statement, and we look forward to working with you in terms of trying to bring about some solutions to the problems. Uh, the General Accounting Office concludes that certain state and local governments will have difficulty implementing health care and welfare reform because of the high concentration of poor people in their jurisdiction. And I think in terms of New York, where we have a large number of undocumented uh, TB epidemic, AIDS epidemic, and uh, uh, should this concern be reflected in our health care and welfare reform legislation for a city that uh, just has all kinds of problems and, uh, and of course, uh, high unemployment, and, uh, which is getting worse, and then when you look at health care plan as much as uh, health care uh, reform, you get excited about it to a degree, but then when you look and you find out that there's 500,000 undocumented that will not be included, uh, that uh, you have a TB epidemic there that uh, does not address that as well, and then an AIDS problem that it does not address. So then your sh excitement is short-lived. So uh, what do you think that we can do in, with cities like that? Mr. Chairman, first, uh, let me say that as we do health care reform, we have to be very focused, in my view, on the kind of problems that you just presented. I also, though, believe that if we simply refuse to do health care reform, that all of the problems you just mentioned will not only continue to plague state and local government, but they will burgeon in the magnitude of the problem. If we don't, the, the option of doing nothing is unacceptable. Health care costs are, you know, exceeding inflation by two and three times in most states and even higher in some states. The undocumented workers, people who can't afford health insurance are already uh, using Medicaid, are using public hospitals, are using county hospital facilities, and so that's not going to change if we refuse to do something. So the question is, and you've asked it properly, how do we do this in a way that we can make progress on these problems, uh, not put more costs on state and local government, and really begin to move in a, in a proper direction. First of all, if we can really begin to contain health care costs across the board, if we can get an integrated health care system where we are not making hospital administrators professional cost shifters, our doctors, professional cost shifters, that would be a real step in the right direction. Secondly, if we can get real market forces to begin holding down the rate of increase in all health care policies, that will be a major help. And that indeed has to be looked at very carefully in this plan. Third, we need to carefully look at how Medicaid program is treated in this health care program. Now, in the Clinton program, as I understand it, there is an attempt 
to distinguish between what we call cash Medicaid recipients and non-cash recipients. In other words, Medicaid recipients that are on welfare and those that are not. And in both cases, it's my understanding that in addition to trying to bring this population into the normal market forces that we hope will affect everybody else, in other words, they will begin to buy their health care policy through alliances and have the competitive pressures there that will hopefully hold costs down. There is an attempt to hold state government harmless in terms of the cost they are now paying for Medicaid with the hope that if health care costs are generally brought down that the state's share of Medicaid costs will also be held down. That at least is the theory and the hope, the practical hope that is included in this plan. Now, obviously, uh, the federal government has a responsibility with regard to immigration. The federal government, therefore, I believe, has a responsibility when undocumented uh, workers or people wind up in state and local hospital facilities and present a cost to those state and local governments. And I believe to the extent we are to be blamed for a failure of implementing the immigration laws, that we must be of some help to these state and local governments in carrying out those extraordinary health care expenses. So my answer is I hope and believe this health care plan, if done right, will, will help cut and hold down on health care costs of local and state governments to the extent we have not done our part in implementing the immigration laws we are going to have to be a part of and perhaps a greater part of taking care of those extraordinary costs which incidentally will be more disaggregated and visible uh, if health care reform passes than they've been in the past All right. thank you very much uh, Mr. Majority Leader I yield now to Congressman Micah <clears throat> Uh, Mr. Gephardt, uh, <clears throat> you hit a uh, sensitive ner nerve on uh, the question of immigration coming from Florida. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm very concerned uh, of what I've seen just in the nine months I've been in Congress. Uh, uh, we have a law policy that excluded HIV positives, uh, and we passed a, a measure that the president signed into law and uh, I, I introduced a bill just to reimburse Florida for the costs of a hundred, uh, we'll, we'll probably end up with 120 of 150 Haitian HIV positives that uh, the president uh, brought into the United States. So on one hand, w I hear you saying this, the report saying that we have to pay attention to immigration and the impact. Uh, here in nine months, we've already had another disaster. I'm going to have... Uh, uh, millions of dollars of costs uh, uh, with these HIV infected uh, individuals that have been let, let in. Uh, that's, that's one instance. Everything this Congress has done so far has been further mandates on local government. We passed the Family and Medical Leave Act. Uh, we provided no assistance and that will impact uh, uh, state and local governments. Uh, motor voter. We passed motor voter. There's not, uh, no funding in there to assist them. Uh, it, the uh, tooth fairy isn't going to register these people. It's a, a diff, uh, another impact on them. Uh, the, re the resolution, uh, and this wasn't prompted by this hearing, but uh, you know, I get this resolution yesterday uh, from my county commission. Now, uh, we say one thing and we do something else. So how, how do you... Uh, how do we address this? Uh, you've been a part of this, I've been a part of it, and the Congress is not responding. Uh, what hope do we have that this isn't going to be another straw that breaks the back of uh, local government? Well, two things. One, I believe that by having this report, by having this hearing, uh, we are highlighting the nature and the magnitude of this problem. And I agree with you that if we want certain policies to be followed by state and local governments, uh, we have to be much more straightforward about how they're going to be helped to pay for these policy changes. And uh, 
I think there are two things, maybe three things that we need to do. One, in passing any legislation, we should probably attach some kind of a rider or a provision that at least states forthrightly what the best estimate of what the cost to local government will be and how we're going to deal with it. Maybe that's a suggestion that we might take out of this committee generally to the Congress. Uh, secondly, I think that uh, the Vice President's report, as Representative Condit says, gives us an excellent opportunity to oversight ourselves and to go back to the kinds of things that you brought up and to make perhaps a different judgment on exactly how these things are going to be paid for and again to be more forthright with state and local government about how we're going to cooperate together. Third, I think the Vice President's report also indicates that we need to get rid of a lot of regulatory underbrush that already exists to give state and local governments more flexibility in dealing with problems with federal money so that there are less strings attached, more ability to bring together both federal, state, and local money to address problems. And it may be that we need to comb back through voting rights uh, acts, uh, motor voter type bills, uh, bills on family leave, and say, once again, we didn't do this exactly the way we should have. Let's relook at it. Let's try to get some of the regulatory underbrush out and see if we can make this work better. Uh, another, That's really the purpose, I think, of this hearing is to is to raise those issues and try to review what we've done and to see if we can make it better, fix it. Well, uh, just again, having only been here nine months, uh, I get a parade of local officials of how do we comply. Uh, Clean Air and Water Act, right now they're beside themselves on how they're going to comply with the mandates. Uh, some of them un unreasonable, some of them uh, duplicative. Uh, uh, and uh, they're, they're very concerned about that. The other thing, too, is this Congress has a reputation of not uh, following through. We, we pass uh, revenue sharing. We take revenue sharing away. Uh, we we pass uh, grant programs and aid programs, and we take them away. Uh, so we don't have a very stable uh, reputation. The, uh, another question that I have uh, deals with the uh, uh, subject you brought up relating to uh, and you said cost containment measures will limit health care spending to a predictable level that is below current spending predictions. Um, as a member of the legislature back in the 70s, uh, I opposed a hospital cost containment bill uh, 79 in Florida, which was touted as going to uh, bring all hospital costs under uh, 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 some control. I I'm very leery of these cost containment uh, uh, provisions or schemes by government. And then you also re uh, referred to uh, you believe that market forces are important. How do you justify, uh, you know, your, your um, commentary that uh, uh, we need these government cost containment measures and then market forces, which uh, seem diametrically uh, opposed by, uh, by my experience? Uh, what's your commentary. Sure. I have the same concerns you do about price controls. I think they are uh, largely avoided. Uh, I think they're less than effectual. And that's the reason I think when they wrote this health care plan, they looked for the ability to use market forces to try to hold down on health care costs. And that's why in the plan, they have used a tax mechanism after a period of transition to send a clear signal to consumers that uh, if you want to buy a plan that is at the average in your region, then the government will totally uh, give you all of the tax subsidies and help that we do now. But if you want to buy something greater than that, then you will not get the tax subsidies for the amount between the average amount and what you choose above that. Uh, this is hard to do immediately because all of us are on a different point in the racetrack. Some people have very generous plans that they have 
gotten with their employers. Others have very meager plans. And to say to people right now, given the history of what we've gone through, we're going to put an average cost into the tax mechanism and you're going to be stuck with that today is pretty hard to do. So they give a period of time for this to come in. But I believe when it comes in, it will be the, the best way to use market forces to get consumers to really be tough shoppers for the most cost-effective health care plan they can get. Now, in the meantime, while that is going on, there is an attempt in the bill to put a, a limit on a national health care budget through controlling the increase in the price of premiums for annual plans. Now, that's something we have to sort our way through in the debate on this plan. It may or may not be the best way to get at it. Our problem is that to put the tax mechanism in, which I think is the best way to go about this, you really need to leave five, six, seven, eight, some say ten years of transition in order for people to get to the same place on the, on the track. Well, uh, in conclusion, I just want to thank, uh, again, the majority leader for his uh, contribution today and the chairman. And uh, uh, I think we're all public witness that we've got a firm commitment from the majority leader that as of this date, he'll join me and uh, no longer vote for any uh, unfunded federal mandate uh, legislation. So. <laughs> And to go back and look at the ones that we've done. Okay. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Congressman Micah. I yield now to Congressman Condit. Well, first of all, I, I too would like to commend the Majority Leader for requesting the GO report and uh, trying to find out the fin financial status of, uh, of local governments. And I want to express my appreciation to you f for this work. I would like to follow up on Mr. Meekham's first question. And you, you made a suggestion that, that possibly we should revisit uh, some of the legislation that passed, such as motor voter, voting rights, uh, family leave, which are all laudable goals, very honorable things to do. And, and um, uh, I don't think most people would not find fault with, with the goals and objectives in those legislation. And I do think we should go back and revisit those. But what I'd like to know is, is it possible, I, we're going to debate this issue, and, and we should, but it is, is it possible for us in some way to, in the short term, have a moratorium on legislation that's moving today and moving through the House in, in this session so that we don't do this, so that we don't continue to put burdens on local governments and then have to come back after the election or next year and revisit those issues. Is there something that we can do in the short term to, to find, out what, find out what the uh, cost is to local governments and, and maybe do a moratorium so that we don't do this and we don't have to go back and revisit those issues. I think hopefully by this report and by this hearing and other hearings you're going to have uh, and other activities we can have, we can greatly heighten the understanding and sensitivity of all of our members and, and everyone in the Congress to this problem and begin through the mechanism of review before we bring legislation to the floor that has consequences for state and local governments where we are not helping to fund these, to have these brought out forthrightly. Maybe the idea would be to require some kind of writer or provision on every bill that would address this question. Uh, we used to have uh, fiscal notes are required uh, on some legislation. Maybe we need a a state and local uh, cost note where we at least have to face the question squarely as opposed to just going forward with the, uh, the emotion of the moment. Well, I, I offered an amendment to uh, Motor Voter to do that. I failed on the floor. Uh, to the Voting Rights Act, I, or excuse me, to the Voting Rights Act, I failed on the floor. Motor Voter, um, I could not get a rule so that I could offer such amendment, but I would encourage you to assist us in doing that, I, even at a, if it's just a, at a minimum defining what the cost is. Right. Um, for me, that's not enough. We actually need to reimburse the cost, but at least in the short term, if we could do that, that would be most helpful. And I do appreciate you being here and your interest in this issue. It's a very helpful suggestion. Right. Let me thank you, too. Um, 
it's the majority leader for c coming and uh, and the leadership you provided in this area. And I want to know that uh, it's greatly appreciated. But let me just say to my colleagues, though, uh, I don't think we need to go back and visit too much. I think that uh, the motor voter, leave it alone. Voting rights, leave it alone. I think there's enough that we have confronting us to just sort of go forward and begin to examine it from that point on. So uh, I would suggest that as we look at, you know, uh, health care, we look at uh, welfare reform, we look at all the other things that will be coming down the road, I think there will be enough to sort of keep us busy and to be able to just try to uh, begin to protect from this point on. And I here again appreciate the leadership that you uh, have shown in this area and your concern and your commitment and recognizing your sensitivity to it and the fact that there should be some flexibility in order for states and local governments to be able to do some of the things that we're asking them to do. So I look forward to working with you uh, to, from this point on. I'm not too interested in going way back in, in dealing with motor voter and civil rights. So <laughs> I want to go on the record saying that. Thank you very much Thank you for very your testimony. Much. Appreciate it. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I, I'd like to ask unanimous consent that uh, this resolution from the uh, Board of County Commissioners of Seminole County, Florida, be made a part of the uh, record. Without objection, will be included. Thank you. Our next witness is Mr. Gregory McDonald. Mr. McDonald is the Director of Operations in the Human Resources Division of the General Accounting Office. And Mr. McDonald will be accompanied by James Kirkman, Associate Director of Operations at GAO. And just before, before you take your seat, it's the custom of uh, the committee to swear in the witnesses. So if you'd be kind enough to stand up and raise your right hand. Do you swear that the testimony you will give is the truth and the whole truth and nothing but the truth, if the answer to it is yes? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentlemen, welcome to the subcommittee. We have your prepared statement, which without objection will be included in the record. Please proceed to summarize your testimony. Your statement will be included in the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, uh, and I will summarize. Mr. Chairman, as the nation begins to debate health care reform, welfare reform, and other major policy initiatives in which state and local governments are expected to play a key role, questions persist concerning the financial condition of these governments. At the request of the majority leader, as we've heard this morning, we looked at the short and long-term financial conditions of states, cities, and counties. We found that from 1985 to 1991, State and local governments faced myriad spending and revenue pressures. Most categories of programs were growing. This growth in spending partly reflected officials' choices favoring some new or expanded services and programs, but it also reflected factors beyond the immediate control of state and local officials, such as rising health care costs or regional economic problems. Certain programs grew more rapidly than others. For example, state health care spending grew at an average annual rate of 7.6 percent during the period. Medicaid grew even faster at an average of 9.5 percent per year over the same period. The high growth rates for health care spending were especially important because health care formed a large share of overall state spending, on average 21 percent of state general expenditures in 1991. While at the beginning of the period, revenue growth was enhanced by robust economic growth, Later, it was dampened by a slowing economy and a recession. In many cases, revenue projections based on previous year's growth did not materialize. In addition, jurisdictions faced declines in some types of federal aid and experienced voter reluctance to increase taxes. Federal grants for capital projects and other general operations declined from 1985 to 1991. Moreover, with state and local taxes plus other own source receipts approaching a 25-year high in the mid-1980s, voters in several states enacted limitations on revenue raising, adding to the growing list of states with such restrictions. In response, jurisdictions acted to control program growth, cut services, and raise revenues. State and local governments instituted spending cuts that affected a variety of programs, government payrolls, and capital projects. 
Many of the actions involved managing existing financial resources through measures such as tapping into contingency reserves, shifting monies from one budget fund to another, and restructuring debt. However, other actions involve substantive efforts to raise revenues and control spending. We note that some of these actions may simply postpone rather than eliminate costs. For example, several jurisdictions reduced or deferred capital spending, actions which may add to long-term capital costs. Off-budget transactions, such as California's off-budget loans to education districts, may understate long-term program costs for education. And finally, in examples such as those in California and Colorado, officials told us of reductions in contributions to employee pension plans, a strategy that could result in increased future liabilities. Revenue actions ranged from increasing fees to raising taxes. These included actions to increase property sales, gas tax receipts, and increase fees and charges. Increases to fees and charges were most used but you'll note a, uh, a particular example of revenue action occurred in Connecticut, which became the 41st state to enact a broad-based personal income tax. In spite of these budget adjustment actions, spending continued to outpace revenues, bringing year-end surpluses down. With lower surpluses to carry forward as budget cushions, jurisdictions experienced a reduced flexibility for increasing the funding of existing services or undertaking new initiatives. However, other indicators of budgetary condition generally did not show similar deterioration. Cash and security holdings available to each of the three levels of government generally rose slightly or remained relatively constant over the 1985 to 91 period, and levels of both short and long-term governmental debt outstanding were generally stable or decreasing. While the sector as a whole may have not have been in imminent crisis, many jurisdictions, including the state of New Jersey, the city of Detroit, Los Angeles County, and others that were widely reported on by the media experienced significant stress. Many incurred budget deficits and deterioration in other indicators of financial health. Of the 50 states, 56 largest cities, and 77 large counties we analyzed, eight states, 16 cities, and 27 counties experienced deficits when averaged over a three-year period between 1989 and 91. These budget trends may improve in the short term as the economy improves or as elected officials further adjust their spending and taxing priorities. However, many poorer jurisdictions, those with relatively high poverty levels and low per capita income, face a more fundamental longer term problem. These jurisdictions have less capacity to finance their police, fire, and other basic services at average levels because of their relatively low tax bases. The best example of this is seen in the older central cities that have experienced industrial-based deterioration and middle-class flight to the suburbs, leaving behind high concentrations of people in poverty or with low personal incomes. In this regard, we found a significant trend affecting our nation's large cities. Over the past two decades, the poorer cities experienced a deterioration in the levels of basic services they could afford, while the suburbs and better-off cities improved. Residents of the poorer jurisdictions who can least afford it would have had to shoulder higher tax burdens than residents of better off cities to finance city services at comparable levels. If the weakest cities had wanted to levy average tax burdens and finance services at average levels, they would have needed additional outside funds equal to an estimated 36 percent of their own tax revenues to do so. Our study identified large cities and several large counties that faced not only a short-term problem of budget deficits, but also a long-term deterioration in the public services that they can afford to provide. Such jurisdictions may have the most difficulty in overcoming their financial problems and meeting the service needs of their residents. Mr. Chairman, there are large disparities in the levels of services that states and cities can afford. Disparities at the city level are of particular con concern to us. Absent strong economic growth in the poorer cities, residents of those cities will be left further and further behind those of better off communities in terms of receiving services for reasonable tax burdens. Furthermore, the declines in budgetary surpluses at the state, county, and city levels, which have turned into deficits in some jurisdictions, are a disturbing trend. Unless reversed, it implies a decreasing flexibility, at least in the short term, for undertaking new investment programs and responding to emerging issues 
such as reforms to health care and welfare, as you've mentioned this morning. Finally, on a broader scale, the declining state and local budgetary surpluses in recent years have added to the federal deficit's effects, impeding stronger long-term growth in the U.S. economy. In this regard, the budget problem that we talk about as it affects the future of the nation's economy is not simply a federal deficit problem, but rather a general governmental problem in the federal system. Viewing the matter in this broader total intergovernmental context could help federal officials better gauge the size of the overall problem and devise appropriate budget and economic growth strategies. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my prepared statement. I would like to acknowledge the fact that there's a talented group of people at GAO who've contributed an awful lot to this work over the last two years. Many of them are here with us this morning, and I'd just like to acknowledge for the record their contributions. And we'd be happy to answer any questions you or the committee may have. Right. Thank you very much for your testimony. And uh, I think that it's very timely. Your report is at best a mixed bag for state and local governments. Some are holding their own, according to uh, your statement, while others are in desperate financial condition. What are some of the policy choices that the cities and states in the worst financial conditions have had to make in order to survive? And what were the consequences for the residents when they had to make these difficult choices? Hey, Mr. Chairman, in, uh, in the report, I think we, we look at some of the, uh, the things that took place in all of the jurisdictions. You had cuts in uh, a number of service programs. Uh, we cited instances from officials in uh, numerous cities and counties of cuts in social service programs, rehabilitation programs. Uh, increasing the uh, density in corrections facilities, uh, deferring capital expenditures for items such as road repair or the repair of uh, school buildings. So there are uh, a number of varying circumstances and the choices from community to community obviously differed. You know, and I, I, I agree with you and I think that um, uh, when we look at the problem, you know, when you talked about in terms of uh, that one way to change it, that it would probably bring have to be some large economic growth. But the problem is that the areas that have, that have the problems is generally not going to get that economic growth. And that's a, another problem. So uh, uh, I guess as we begin to look at this, we would have to try and find some kind of formula that would be able to sort of assist those areas that uh, are really, really having great difficulty to try and to uh, some way or another uh, create some kind of economic growth for them uh, and the federal government sort of participating in that process in order to make it happen. It's economic growth is, uh, um, is somewhat of an elusive target. It's, uh, it's absolutely necessary, particularly in the areas that have, uh, that have deteriorated over time, like our large central cities. Uh, some of those jurisdictions have uh, very few uh, options available to them of the kind that, uh, that over time they've traditionally employed uh, in terms of powers to, uh, to annex or to increase their tax bases. There are difficult problems of uh, attracting uh, the economic base back into the cities, for example, uh, once it's left. Um, they're not easy problems. I agree with you, sir. Let me ask you this question then. You know, there's been a lot of talk about health care reform. I'm sure you've heard about it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, based on your investigation, how difficult would it be for the states in the weakest financial condition to implement the administration's health care proposal? I don't think there's an empirical answer to that yet. Uh, some of the things that we've uh, heard coming from, uh, from very po various policy analysis groups like the Urban Institute around town uh, would suggest that that analysis just isn't out there, that, the, that no one really knows for sure uh, what the costs are going to be. A substantial portion, as uh, the majority leader uh, alluded to this morning, of uh, the um, cost containment provision in the health care proposal 
involves the, the ability to hold down costs for uh, Medicaid in particular, and that's going to have a, a major impact on the states. To the extent that we can hold Medicaid costs down, uh, and only time will tell on that, uh, we should in the long term have an ability to, to help state budgets because it's such a, a huge portion of their, uh, of their budgets. The, in the short term, it's another program and another administrative structure that uh, states are going to need to put in place uh, in order to um, implement the health care proposal, at least the proposal that uh, is on the table from the administration uh, at this point. And I don't think it's uh, clear to any of us at this point uh, how they're going to go about doing that or what the implications uh, from state to state of the various mechanisms that they might employ would, uh, would play out. But you do believe that we should know the cost before implementing it. I don't want to put you on the spot. Let me move on. Uh, yeah. I don't want to do that. But let me ask you this. Uh, uh, does the fact that most jurisdictions are not operating at a deficit mean that the needs of the residents in the jurisdictions are being fully met? You know, uh, we have certain local uh, governments and some of the states, you know, are talking about that they do not have a deficit. But when you look at some of the things that they're doing to prevent from having a deficit, uh, you almost wish they would have a deficit uh, because of the kind of things they're doing to be able to survive. Uh, um, what are your comments on that in terms of as you were able to sort of look and to see some of the things that they're doing in order to uh, prevent having a deficit? Well, when we looked at the uh, budget coping actions in, uh, at jurisdictions, I think we found uh, coping actions on both the revenue and, and expenditure side in, in richer and uh, poorer jurisdictions alike. You could go to Fairfax County or Montgomery County, which are some of the richest jurisdictions in the nation, and uh, see budgetary coping actions that to the cities and, and or to the residents of those, uh, of those counties uh, are calling for cuts in the levels of services that they provide. So I think the the jurisdictions are are providing uh, a level of coping that that would imply that you know they no they're not meeting the all of the needs or all of the demands of their residents. Um, what they decide to cut, uh, the choices that an individual jurisdiction uh, in California might make versus uh, say the city of Detroit. Uh, which is in, in very tight uh, fiscal constraints uh, would be would be different, but I think the uh, to the people that are most affected by those decisions, um, they would say that all of their needs are not necessarily being met. Mm -hmm. You know, in reading your statement, I noticed that uh, uh, sometimes you lump cities and counties uh, together as local jurisdictions. Uh, do you see them in the same light or, or, or are there important differences in their financial situations? I couldn't quite determine that when, in terms of reading your statement. Uh, no, Mr. Chairman, I think there are some important differences. Um, one in particular that, that comes to mind uh, with the counties, uh, as we were going through and doing our analysis that jumped out at us, at us is the, uh, the linkage between the counties and the states uh, in a great number of instances. The counties are heavily dependent on, uh, on state aid. Uh, some 33 percent on average of county revenues come from intergovernmental aid passed through from the states. And uh, in some instances that's as high, some of the ones that we had seen, it was as high as 60 percent of, of county revenues uh, it came from state aid. As the states have been squeezed in their budgetary uh, crunch, a number of them have cut state aid or reduced the growth in state aid. And that has in turn squeezed the counties, which tend to be uh, in a number of uh, locations kind of the jurisdiction of last resort dealing with uh, human service needs uh, of the local population. And the counties tend to have uh, less revenue flexibility in their own to make up for uh, cuts in, in state aid in particular, but also in federal aid. Right. Thank you very much. And uh, let me this time to yield to the ranking member of the subcommittee for any opening statement he might have or questions at this time. Uh, Congressman uh, Schiff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, I want to say to you and uh, 
uh, the other members of the subcommittee and the witnesses, I apologize for being late, but I had votes in, in the Judiciary Committee that I had to attend before I could come to this hearing. I want to thank Congressman Micah for uh, serving as ranking member during this hearing. Uh, I have uh, uh, one question that I'd like to get into, one area I'd like to get into with Mr. McDonald, and that is uh, in terms of pressures uh, financially on local governments, state governments, and so forth, we've been hearing more and more about unfunded mandates from the state and local governments. And the, the federal government uh, has engaged in quite a number of, of unfunded mandates found in a variety of bills. And in each one of them, we can say they had a, they had a, 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 a national purpose that we wanted to accomplish. But one after the other after the other is causing uh, state and local officials to come to me and I believe to my colleagues in the Congress and start saying, wait a minute, you know, you keep piling these on us and not funding them. We find it difficult to comply and still perform our other basic services. And I wonder if that, was, uh, that aspect was looked at by the General Accounting Office in terms of, of compiling this report. Um, certainly, I think we, like you, as we talked with local officials, uh, heard a lot of discussion about uh, mandates and the impact of mandates on budgetary decisions at the state and local level. Uh, we're also doing some, some separate work, not contained within this study, but specifically focused on mandates that's still ongoing at this point for uh, Chairman Conyers and uh, Congressman Condit has been involved with uh, some discussions with on that particular work as well. Um, what we've been hearing from uh, the officials at state and local levels, uh, I think, is relatively consistent. And that is, as Mr. Condit mentioned earlier this morning, um, no one really disagrees with the, uh, the purpose for which uh, a mandate might have uh, been laid out. Uh, no one stands up and says, we really don't want clean drinking water or breathable air or uh, access for the disabled. Um, but there are generally four issues that come up in the mandate discussion uh, that we hear. Um, in particular, with uh, some of the environmental mandates, uh, we have heard from local officials and our own work in uh, some reports that we've published back from 1991 forward on env environmental protection shows that uh, some of the scientific evidence, uh, and particularly in the environmental area, is not conclusive on, on the need for some of the things that are being done, uh, that are being mandated at uh, state and local level, either through legislation or, uh, or regulation. So there's question about the quality of the science in some of those. Uh, second, uh, local governments uh, view mandates as being intrusive that they force budgetary and policy agenda on local governments that are not subject to, uh, to debate within the, uh, the government themselves or, or with the, con the local constituents and uh, tend to circumvent the local budget process or drive the local budget process. Uh, in that regard, I think uh, local governments are looking for really more flexibility, uh, not in what they do as, a, as an overall outcome, but how they get there, and, uh, and the ability to help with, uh, with local uh, priorities or put local priorities into uh, context with the mandates. The third thing we hear has to do with the flexibility of the federal government and kind of a one-size-fits-all mentality that says that uh, one size really doesn't fit all and that there are local circumstances that um, can and should be taken into account in the regulatory process or in the legislative process, and that more collaboration uh, from state and local officials with the federal government uh, on the front end of things would be uh, deeply appreciated. And then obviously the, the fourth one is the issue that you've raised and other members of the committee have raised, and that's uh, the costs. And uh, I don't think it makes any particular difference which set of numbers you use. Uh, they're all large. And you could take a, a conservative approach or, a, or a, um, a very expansive approach on the cost of what constitutes a quote unquote mandate. Um, but the, the bottom line is that they cost a lot. Uh, one of the things that I think our report points out is that there's not much flexibility in the system at this point in time to accommodate. Uh, costs either at the f uh, at the federal level, state, or local levels. 
would like to ask about one, just one more thing. I don't know, since this, uh, since this study began two years ago, as I understand it, I don't know that you would have gotten into this, but uh, part of the outline we have of the administration's health care plan, and I want to stress all we have now is an outline. There is no bill that's been introduced into the Congress, so when people say they're for it or against it, I wonder what it is they're, they're evaluating, since we don't have a bill yet to, to in front of us. But we do have broad outlines, certainly. And one of those broad outlines is that, if I understand it correctly, uh, most people will be compelled to join regional alliances for the, for the collective purchasing of, of uh, health care. And that uh, the regional alliances will be set up uh, by state governments, that no regional alliance is to be therefore larger than the state. And my question is, I wonder if you took that particular question up with the state governments in view of the fact that most states, I think, don't have any experience in setting up health care planning for their for their all of their citizens. It's never been their role. Even though I, I understand there'll be a new federal agency to to oversee them. Uh, I wonder if you did bring this up and if you heard any trepidation from the states where they said we're going to be in charge of what, you know, uh, in the future. Uh, maybe you didn't get to that at, at this point, but I'd like to know if you did. No, this, the short answer is is no, we didn't. Right. The proposal from the administration's uh, too recent. Came, came too recently. I, I understand. All right. I thank you, and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Congressman Schiff. I now yield to Congressman Micah. I haven't had a great deal of time to look at this uh, report, but uh, uh, one of the things that uh, I was surprised you didn't do is to put some uh, some additional language in here that rel relates to uh, imposition of federal and state mandates. Uh, I, did I miss that, or is there something that ties uh, this to a figure of what it costs? Uh, no, there's nothing in the report that would tie it to, uh, to a figure of, of what it costs. But you're saying I don't, I don't think there is an authoritative uh, figure of, of what specific mandates would cost on a you're saying uh, it is significant, basis. though, and it is one of the major uh, issues w that was raised by uh, these local governments. Is that correct? It's an issue that we heard at every uh, every stop along the way mm -hmm. as we were doing our case. The other thing I noticed, too, in your report, um, you do, uh, I guess it was page 69, there's a chart about the intergovernmental aid. And you do talk about the decline in assistance uh, to local governments. Uh, was that... Uh, I, I didn't see any figures as to how big an impact that has uh, had. I spoke earlier uh, uh, about, uh, you know, the federal government giveth and the federal government taketh away kind of uh, mm -hmm. routine. Uh, is there, did you have any uh, facts or, or statistics on how much that has declined, say, over a 10-year period or 9-year period or the period of the study? Um, in fact, there was this report that we were releasing today, that the majority leader released today, was uh, the second of two that we had done uh, under his request. The first one was done uh, last year, March of uh, 1992, and it looked at uh, over a 30-year period, uh, the sector as a whole, and there's some specific information in it on uh, intergovernmental revenues or uh, aid from the federal government and uh, what that decline has been. And it separates out that, uh, that aid uh, in the context of uh, entitlement programs or payments to individuals, which has, have been going up uh, consistently throughout the period. Uh, of course, that's being driven by Medicaid um, as, a, as a major driver, but AFDC is That would be one of the, the bigger... Uh that's a, a fairly large Amount. chunk of, uh, of federal payments Amounts. that have been going to state and local governments. What's gone down was uh, obviously the, uh, the repeal of uh, general revenue sharing right. in the mid-80s. And uh, then there have been declines in grants for capital projects. Uh, there have been declines in, uh, in general assistance kinds of mm -hmm. programs. Um, and your report also discloses that uh, state revenues are... Um, uh, and aid to cities and counties is uh, is uh, the the biggest source of uh, aid. Is that that's that's correct? And I guess counties are getting 33 percent or something of their deriving 33 uh, cities 21 percent something like that. Yes. My question is, uh, do you, did you look at how much of that is passed through? Is that 
uh, federal money also that's going to states and then pass through? Uh, do you know? Uh, no, we separated out the federal aid that was uh, that was ultimately ending up. Um, so, so that's uh, pure. That's, that's pure state aid. Uh, a substantial portion of that, I think, you'll find is in uh, is in education and uh, social services, state general assistance payments, things of that sort. Well, your report does, you know, put into writing some of the things we already knew that, you know, the Northeast and some other areas are having uh, more difficult times. The core cities are having uh, a um, uh, very difficult times. The areas of suburban growth have some increased revenues. We have capitated uh, tax uh, uh, mandates by the public and, and uh, uh, mandates. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of uh, answers, though, for the <laughs> future. Uh, did you have any recommendations or anything that you think the committee should pay particular uh, uh, attention to that, uh, or, or focus in on that might assist us, or things to look out for, uh, a general direction uh, to uh, the policymakers here? Well, I think the ge the general overall uh, point that I ended on is one that I'd like to emphasize, and that's that uh, I think we need to s think more in terms of uh, the total financial uh, impact of government at all levels, and not simply a federal budget or a state budget or uh, or local budgets. When we think about the budgetary impact of uh, of things we do, um, I think increasingly. Uh, we need to think about the total intergovernmental impact of uh, the policies that are enacted and the and the programs that we promulgate. The um, in terms of, of very specific policies for uh, economic stimulus or things of that sort, uh, we left that to you in the Congress. Thank you, Mr. McDonnell, and uh, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you very much, uh, Congressman Micah. I now yield to Congressman Condit. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you made reference, uh, Mr. McDonald, a few minutes ago about uh, the full committee chairman, uh, Mr. Conyers, uh, involvement in this issue, and, and he has been involved, and we, we appreciate that very much. It, it's my understanding that the General Accounting Office uh, has nearly um, completed a request to Mr. Conyers on a second study which uh, focuses specifically on um, unfunded federal mandates. Uh, are you aware of this study? That's correct. And do you have any knowledge when this study is supposed to come out? Um, I would hope within the next uh, several weeks. We're uh, in the processes of, uh, of reviewing uh, some early drafts, and then we've got the mechanical process of, of printing. We wait anxiously uh, for the second report, so keep us posted on that. Page we 9 will. of the report states that uh, this current report that officials at all uh, three level cities or uh, uh, levels cited that budget uh, affects. Uh, of the federal and state mandates, city county officials were particularly concerned about the considerable cost of mandates to improve environmental quality. Uh, and I know that you've touched on some of this, but would you please expand on this? Did, did cities and county officials provide you with cost estimates of the mandates? You didn't include it in the report, but, but did they offer that to you? As a general rule, no. We're aware from uh, some of the specific mandate work we've done in, in the other study that you referenced of some cost studies that have been done by individual jurisdictions. The one that gets the most notoriety lately is the one from Columbus, Ohio, and that's been replicated or is being replicated in a number of, uh, of different places. Um, we did not independently uh, seek out uh, specific costs and most of the of the numbers that came to us in the course of uh, doing the work were more anecdotal uh, the I think the the issue on costs is not how fine a point we put on what the actual number is but more the point that I think uh, everyone is in agreement that they are large did they refer to other mandates besides uh, environmental Environmental mandates seem to, to get the most attention from officials at all of the levels that we talked with. Um, we began to notice uh, as people are uh, grappling with the implementation of the Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, concerns from uh, local officials, particularly uh, school officials, about uh, the costs of architectural uh, changes to um, meet the requirements of the act. 
and about the uh, the time frame for implementation and concern that they may not be able to make all of the necessary uh, physical changes uh, given shrinking capital budgets in the uh, time allotted under the act you you um, sort of mentioned this the uh, the impact of the, the cost factor of mandates impacting local budgets can you give us did they give you any examples and can you, you share those examples with us this morning to what extent they were impacting local budgets mm, not with information that I that I have that I'd like to, to quote this morning we do have some information as a as a course of doing the the other study that I'd be happy to provide okay. you and uh, submit for the record if you want in your report uh, you stated on page 7 that the federalism policy of the 1980s and the federal budgetary re-entrenchment re uh, were accompanied by increased regulatory requirements and less federal aid to certain general operations of government. Can you please be more specific in that um, statement? When you talk about uh, federal aid to the general operations of government and the decline that started in the, uh, in the 60s, you're generally referring to general revenue sharing and uh, the um, cessation of general revenue sharing to uh, local governments uh, starting 1986, I believe. On page 9 your your report, you noted that deteriorating conditions in states such as California due to the recession, defense cuts uh, are to, uh, to more recent events uh, are not uh, reflected in your analysis. Uh, would these conditions uh, uh, affect short-term, long-term financial conditions? Uh, in particular with California, I think they, they affect both. Uh, when we say it's not reflected in the analysis, it's not reflected in the analysis we did with census data because it uh, isn't that current. We spent quite a bit of time doing study work in California uh, and using data from other sources, from uh, state and local officials in the state, uh, from uh, some of the studies that have been done by uh, the National Association of State Budget Officers and others. Um, and we see, uh, particularly with California, continuing deterioration in the more recent years. Uh, California, as we allude to in the report, has also been affected by uh, a loss of jobs, as you're aware, uh, out of state, uh, and uh, then hit again with uh, some of the defense cutbacks, particularly in the southern part of the state. Southern California is uh, very heavily dependent on uh, a very heavy presence. Were there uh, cities? Were there cities and counties and states that were cutting services while at the same time experiencing population increase? Uh, yes, I don't have the population increase numbers with me, but I think the short answer to your question is yes. In your opinion, and based on your work so far, do you believe that unfunded federal mandates are a significant strain on local and state budgets? I know I'm going to get another shot at you in a few weeks or someone, <laughs> but do you have a response to that? I don't think there's any question that there's a that there's a strain on the budgets at state and local government. Mr. McDonald, thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, thank you for allowing me to participate. Thank you, thank you very much. Let me also thank you too, Mr. McDonald. And uh, I think that uh, one thing that if you could uh, sort of look to see in terms of um, what happened before the end of revenue sharing, as you continue to look at this, and what happened after we eliminated revenue sharing. And just to see in terms of uh, how much in terms of uh, uh, the dollars were used at that time to deal with mandates. And I think uh, I would like to, 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 to just take a look at that in terms of how much was actually used from revenue sharing to deal with mandates. Okay, I, I know from previous revenue sharing work that I, that I did in, uh, in state and local government, a um, number of years ago, Mr. Chairman, it's sometimes very difficult to track uh, where revenue sharing dollars were actually having an impact in, in the budgets of state and local governors, governments. Um, the, the term we used for it at the time was fungible. Uh, in the basically those dollars when they, because uh, they had very few strings attached to them and uh, left great discretion to the using government as to where they would put them, uh, were not, it was not easily to track the actual impact of dollars that were coming from the federal government for revenue sharing because a jurisdiction might use it for uh, one particular type of project that that would then free up local money to do something else with. There are some jurisdictions that, uh, that very clearly and separately track the revenue sharing dollars, but as a general rule, that wasn't, uh, wasn't the case uh -huh. um, across the country. So it, 
it may be difficult to to give you a precise answer to a before and after comparison of uh, of the impact of revenue sharing on mandates. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much, Mr. McDonald, uh, for your testimony, and uh, we will keep the record open, waiting for the additional information that you uh, indicated you would send. Thank you, Mr. Thank you very much for your testimony. Our final witness today will be Raymond Shepock, Executive Director of the National Governors Association, Barbara Todd, President of the National Association of Counties, and Frank Schaffroth, Director of the National League of Cities. It is the custom of this committee to swear in, swear in witnesses. If you would stand and raise your right hand, do you swear that the testimony you would give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? If so, answer in the affirmative. I do. Yes, yes, I do. Take your seat. I would like to welcome you to the subcommittee. We have your prepared statement, which without objection will be included in the record. Mr. Shepock, we will begin with you. Please proceed and summarize until we have time so the members will have an opportunity to ask specific questions. Mr. Shepock. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm pleased to be here this morning. And I will briefly summarize my statement. Um, first, I think it's important to look back at the period of the 1980s. I guess we would call that the glorious 1980s at this particular time. Uh, spending growth in the states actually grew over that period about 8 percent per year uh, over the entire period, and that even includes a major recession in 1983. Uh, there was great stability, little budget cutting, and few tax increases, and states really had uh, the ability to do a lot of innovation and a lot of new programs during that period. Obviously, the slowdown uh, started in 1990, 1991. Not only did we have a slowdown in revenues, but we had explosive uh, growth in the Medicaid uh, area. Uh, Medicaid is now, over the last several years, averaging well over uh, 20 percent. Uh, in, I think, 1990, 1991, uh, the average was probably close to 30 percent uh, per year. Uh, this has caused uh, significant cutbacks in other program areas and actually caused states to increase tax revenues by $25 billion over the 1991-1992 period. And that's one of the reasons that you're seeing that this uh, resentment of tax increases, because revenues fell off so quickly and so much during that period, and you had such high rev um, growth in Medicaid that they really had to raise taxes fairly significantly. This has set off a really an inward look at state government right now in terms of efficiency, privatization, many of the things that the Vice President has been doing in, in the National uh, Performance uh, Review. If we shift and we look forward in terms of what's going to happen during the decade uh, of the 1990s, I'm afraid that the picture there is also not very good. Uh, I look basically at, at three components. Uh, first, uh, economic growth. I think most estimates now indicate that economic growth over the remainder of this decade will be somewhat less than what we've experienced over the post-war period. Second, however, we have now what I would call a structural deficit on the spending side, much like you at the federal government have, and it's largely because entitlements have now increased at, to be a significant share uh, of state, ben state spending. What do I mean by structural deficit? Basically, if you don't take any action, state spending is going to continue to grow much more rapidly than any measure of gross state product or uh, personal income uh, in an individual state. Um, second, we've um, also got a problem on the revenue side now, that essentially if we do nothing, no policy changes, revenues are going to grow more slowly the rest of the decade than any measure of gross state product. And the reasons for that basically is that the state tax systems that we have in place now are state tax systems that were developed uh, essentially for the economies of the 1930s and 1940s, which meant a manufacturing economy. We don't have tax systems in place that can handle the international marketplace, the rapid change in technology, the huge growth in services. If you look at state taxes, you'll find that there are a number of problems. 
Uh, one, services are exempt in a lot of states from taxes, and that's where all the growth is. Second, a smaller share of personal uh, income is taxable because of the huge increases in Social Security and other transfer payments. Three, the federal government uh, has put restraints at times on state taxes. Fourth, corporations have become much more sophisticated to where they take their corporate profits. They now take them overseas or in states that have no or low corporate profits. States have also moved towards more reliance on gasoline taxes and fees, those particular taxes that are not increasing, like personal income taxes, uh, over time. And six, states have collapsed their tax brackets uh, over time, so they're probably slightly less progressive than they were. But if you add all of these up, what you find is that states are forced to increase taxes just to keep taxes the same share of a gross state product. What are some areas that may affect state taxes, revenues, and the fiscal situation? Uh, I basically want to point to four uh, very, very quickly. Uh, first, I might uh, answer a couple of the questions on, on health care. Uh, you need to be aware that there is an awful lot of state capacity in health care. The state of Hawaii has had universal care since the middle 1970s. They have very good health outputs or measures. They have cost rate of increase much slower than the rest of the nation. And in fact, their average cost is considerably less. So they've had universal care for some period. Second, the states of Oregon, Washington, Florida, Minnesota have already enacted comprehensive health care reform. They cannot implement it basically because of restrictions in ERISA and restrictions in Medicaid. If it weren't for these federal restrictions, we would probably now at this time have comprehensive health care in a good six to eight states. I think that the administration must be commended because uh, we have had a team working with them on health care on the, st the federal state partnership really over the last six months. And I think you'll see when the bill comes up in several weeks that, that a lot of that detail on state flexibility is already incorporated into the plan. And so there's a lot of comfort with the components about how the alliances would work, what the oversight is of the accountable health plans, the transition in terms of when states trigger on to the system. In terms of the cost, I know there's a lot of concern on that, and all I can say is that we are evaluating that uh, in a very detailed way and we'll probably have some state-by-state -state estimates in the next month to two months. But I would say at least the administration's concept is to, in fact, hold states neutral with respect to health care, that the additional cost for low-income individuals and, and small business is supposed to be picked up uh, by the federal government. The other issues that I think are significant are uh, potential impact is uh, school equity is an important issue that states are wrestling with. You've got referendum restrictions that are, that are limiting uh, local taxes and to some extent state taxes. And I think recently this whole explosion of violence and crime, partic particularly with juveniles, uh, is a major issue. I've also listed a number of areas in here where I think the, um, the Congress can help uh, support on the National uh, Performance Review, uh, mandate relief. I would say that we have had now two states that have done comprehensive evaluations of mandates, the state of Tennessee and Ohio, and we can make those available. Um, there's also doing cost-benefit analysis, particularly in the environmental area, uh, would be helpful. And just consultation in general uh, would be very important to building a stronger state-federal partnership. I'll stop, Mr. Chairman, and be happy to answer any questions. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, at this time, I would like to yield to the gentleman from Florida to introduce our next witness. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the subcommittee, it's uh, indeed an honor and privilege for me to introduce uh, Bar Barbara Sheen Todd uh, uh, from Florida. And uh, not only is she here uh, in her capacity uh, uh, as a distinguished uh, participant uh, and uh, a local elec elected official, but she uh, has also distinguished herself uh, as the uh, president of the National Association of Counties. So uh, we know her well in Florida, and uh, uh, I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for allowing me the uh, privilege of uh, honor, uh, honoring uh, with uh, an introduction, uh, again, a, a, a very uh, distinguished and accomplished local government leader. Thank you, Congressman. Let, let me join my <laughs> colleague in welcoming you and 
being one that was involved in county government at one time myself, we are delighted to see you. Well, I could tell when I came in the room from the <clears throat> pearls of wisdom I heard emanating from your lips that each of you had been exposed in a very significant way to uh, the challenges of local government. But <laughs> as the president of the National Organization of Counties, uh, it's an honor to represent our concerns to you. As you know, NACO represents all of the counties in America, the urban counties, the rural counties, the suburban counties. My testimony uh, is going to relate to the General Accounting Office report, which was released today, and the financial conditions of state and local governments, but particularly as it relates to the context of surveys that we have done and our current work on health and welfare reform and the upcoming focus that uh, the National Association of Counties is placing on the unfunded mandates. I want to take this opportunity, Mr. Condit, to express our appreciation to you for sponsoring the unfunded mandates bill and commend you on your leadership in that area. We support you wholeheartedly. Thank you. Uh, the committee has asked us how county financial conditions affect our ability to implement health or welfare reform. In the majority of states, county governments are responsible for financing and or administering health and human services programs. We not only deliver federal and state programs, but we often operate county-only funded programs such as general cash or medical assistance or other programs for needy individuals who do not fit neatly into federal or state eligibility requirements. A few significant facts I might share with you which help outline our involvement. Counties are responsible for spending $30 billion annually on health and hospital costs. In over 30 states, counties are legally and financially responsible for the uninsured. In 20 states, counties contribute to the non-federal share of Medicaid. And in human services, the county role is also extensive. Counties in 18 states contribute to the administrative cost of AFDC, and in 11 states, counties match the non-federal share of benefits. Counties in 23 states participate in a general assistance program, and in 12 of those states, the program operates solely on county taxpayer dollars. In short, in nearly every state, Counties are a funder and an administrator if some, if not all, of the patchwork of federal and state health and human services programs. Not only are the counties often the health and human services safety net, we've also become the federal and state budget safety valve. So our support for reform of health and welfare systems is based on the belief that these are significant national priorities and that they should no longer be shouldered by county property taxpayers. Individuals in need should not be treated differently depending on where they live. And while we believe the President's health proposal is moving in the right direction, we have a number of concerns that relate to local administrative and financial liabilities. Because of our involvement in health, there are a number of questions we have in the initial analysis of President Clinton's health proposal. We prepared a list of 37 questions that get to the heart of the operational complexity and potential fiscal liability of counties in implementing reform. Those issues include our continuing role as providers, at least through the transition, and the need to be assured reimbursement from health plans for persons who continue to come to us for care, regardless of where their health plan tells them to go. Populations such as undocumented immigrants and persons in our jails who await trial are also deemed ineligible under the proposal. So while reform has the potential to relieve our county taxpayers of some of the burden, there are significant local concerns that are not yet resolved. And I listened with interest, Mr. Chairman, to your observations. I was in your great state a few weeks ago addressing the State Association of Counties, and I was appalled as some of the information that came back to me. I met local commissioners from your state, Mr. Chairman, who are submitting half of their general revenue to pay for their Medicaid match. I heard a story from one county official that told me that he had to pay 
and $47 million in Medicaid match for a county of 400,000 people. And that's just part of the match. That, is, that does not include the state match or the federal dollar. So obviously, something must be done. Medicaid in, in New York has become the largest single appropriation in their budgets. In 1993, on average, over 38 percent of county tax levies outside of New York City will be allocated to pay for Medicaid. And if these trends continue, by the year 2000, New York County Medicaid budgets will nearly double, amounting to $7 billion. So too is the case with welfare reform. And I think it's significant to point out that despite the availability of federal funding for the jobs program under the Family Support Act, most states have not had enough of their own resources to draw down their full federal amount on allocation. The resolution you received, uh, Mr. Micah, was not by accident. As you may be aware, the counties and the cities and the school boards and the townships throughout America have joined together in uh, expressing our concern regarding unfunded federal mandates. I submit to you that you will be receiving, all of you, resolutions through, from throughout America. And our concerns will be highlighted in our upcoming National Unfunded Mandate Stay, which is scheduled for October 27th. NACO will be joining with the United States Conference of Mayors, the National League of Cities, and the International City and County Management Association to initiate the first day of a long-term campaign to stop unfunded federal mandates. And along with the United States Conference of Mayors, the National Association of Counties will be releasing a survey of counties and cities on the cost of 10 to 12 of the most troublesome federal mandates. Our own fiscal surveys emphasize the tremendous budget pressures faced by urban and rural counties. Counties are taking action by raising revenues and cutting programs and employees. And I have attached to my testimony a summary of our most recent survey. Let me highlight briefly a few of those findings. In February of 1993, we found in a survey of urban counties that over 80 percent raised additional revenues over the past year. Over three-fourths cut programs. 70% cut their workforce. Three quarters expect to raise additional revenues next year. $10 billion worth of necessary capital projects have been postponed. And our 1992 survey of rural counties revealed similar findings. The GAO report confirms our own findings and it recognizes the legal constraints on raising property taxes in many counties. It identifies spiraling health and corrections costs. It outlines recessionary pressures, declines in federal grants, employee layoffs, local revenue increases, and declaring budget surpluses, uh, decreasing. We appreciate the subcommittee's attention to this issue. We applaud Majority Leader Gephardt for requesting the GAO study. Counties will continue to look for more efficient and effective ways of delivering health and human services programs. And, of course, we support reforms as they're needed, but these reforms cannot be accomplished through additional unfunded federal mandates. Thank right. you. Thank you very much, Ms. Todd. Uh, Mr. Frank Schaefroth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Frank Schaefroth. I'm the Director of Federal Relations and Policy for the National League of Cities. I'm here today on behalf of more than 170,000 municipal elected officials across the country. I'm here today because we believe the fate of cities is inextricably linked with the economic competitiveness of the nation. <clears throat> we hope that this hearing, the second in this series, and the commitment of the majority leader to address not only fiscal disparities, but also the cost of unfunded federal mandates will mark the first step in an effort to create a policy to reinvest in America's economic security and in shaping a national agenda to restructure our economic foundations. We hope that the outcome of this set of hearings will be the development of a short and long-term federal, state, and local partnership and fiscal agenda to make the federal government a positive partner in addressing fiscal disparities, changing current federal policies which we believe add to and exacerbate disparities rather than level the playing field. We support efforts to restructure and reform health care in this country from two perspectives which are comparable to yours. First, for our employees, 
second for our constituents. Would like to give some background for some of the issues. And with regard to the issues that are face and front forward in this committee, we think with regard to health care, there are certain critical issues. How any of the alliance plans draw borders for health care alliances stand the possibility of pitting cities against suburbs, potentially further exacerbating disparities between richer and poorer communities within states. The recent decision within the administration to exclude states and local governments from the cap on employer contributions <clears throat> could impose severe constraints on the smallest municipalities, many of which are in New Mexico, for instance, and the nation's poorest cities. The explanation we received on Saturday morning from the administration is because cities have an unlimited capacity to raise taxes. They ought not to be forced to play by the same rules as business. Congressman Condit, as you know, in California, there is no such unlimited capacity. Uh, proposition two and a half in Massachusetts, 13, and limitations in many states indeed put a strict cap on revenue raising capacity. Third, any plan which imposes uniform requirements irrespective of physical capacity will, in our view, almost be certain to fail. It's now been nearly 18 months since our nation witnessed the most serious civil disturbance in more than a century. Fires in the city of Los Angeles were starting at a rate of three per minute. An era of neglect spawned an awful 24 hours of rage, hate, and frustration. For more than a decade, the federal government has had no national policy for cities. That the terrible tragedy of Los Angeles should have come as a shock to the nation is a sharp reminder of how distant Washington has become from the cities and towns and counties that have been the economic foundation of our country. As we testified before this subcommittee in your first hearing, we are concerned that current welfare policies and current phys physical and physical policies aggravate rather than work towards the construction of strong municipal and metropolitan foundations for the future. The basic problems that we see changing, and these are different problems than we experienced two decades ago. Today, 30 percent of children in central cities live in poverty, 26 percent of children in rural small towns. In 1991, the federal government spent an average of $13 for every American over the age of 65, for every $1 for every American under the age of 18. In 1982, in Minneapolis, 25 percent of the children in the public school system came from single heads of households. Today, that percentage is 50. By 1997, it is projected to be 75 percent. The dissolution of families leads almost inevitably to drugs, <laughs> juvenile crime, dropouts, AIDS, and failure. It is an omen. As our president said, without a change, cities in this country will die. Crime. Last year, violent crime increased by 65% in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. It's not a big urban center. It's a small, relatively rural municipality. The recent recession has drastically changed the nature of joblessness from one of being temporary to permanent has contributed to the growth of a large underclass in city after city in America. More and more we saw in the last decade that for an American who had a bullet hole in his or her stomach, who had a violent illness, their only redress was to dial 911. The cost was imposed upon municipalities. Disparities in per capita income between central cities and suburbs now stands at the highest levels ever recorded in this country. Between 1960 and 1989, the ratio has experienced a steady deterioration dropping from 105 percent in 1960 to 84 percent in 1989. That decline in incomes is translated into severe declines in city tax bases, but huge increases in public needs for services and facilities. It has come during a period of the sharpest declines in federal assistance, and at the latter end of the decade, growing declines by states, as you heard from Mr. Shapak as states were forced to deal with growing crime rates, prison costs, and Medicaid costs. The Chapter 9 municipal bankruptcy filing by Bridgeport, Connecticut in 1991 was not an aberration. If anything, it's an extraordinary tribute to the ingenuity of municipal elected officials that in a year when one million businesses filed for corporate bankruptcy, that was the only city in America to do so. 
In 1986, the authority and ability of cities to issue tax-exempt bonds was significantly limited, and extraordinarily complex and expensive arbitrage and rebate mandates were imposed. So what we saw over the decade of the 1980s, Congress enacted 172 laws imposing requirements or mandates on states and local governments, but cut funding to local governments by 75 percent and cut back on municipal authority to borrow to finance compliance with those new mandates. Moreover, as the importance of investment, physical and physical grew, disparities in the cost of financing grew so that the cost to Bridgeport to finance the cost of building a new school or bridge or jail could be more than 100 basis points higher than its adjacent and far wealthier suburban jurisdiction of Fairfield County, Connecticut. In effect, as we reported earlier to this committee, the decade of the 80s saw physical disparities between central cities and suburbs grow to the greatest levels ever recorded. For those reasons, we very much were excited about the majority leader's presentation this morning. I want to note finally, as we saw during the economic recovery legislation that the President signed in August, that while it retains the cap on federal discretionary spending, there is no comparable cap on tax expenditures and federal entitlement spending, which primarily benefit non-metropolitan areas and have continued the unrelenting growth of expenditures in those areas which dwarf direct assistance to states and local governments but provide federal aid more and more to those least in need while taking away federal aid more and more to those most in need who tend to be in small rural cities or counties or in central cities. So we believe very strongly that current federal policies, without consciously being set, are doing far more to contribute to problems and the disparities the General Accounting Office report presented to you this morning than dealing with us in a federalistic manner to address the problems of concern to the subcommittee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, too, for your testimony. What I'd like to do at this point is to break for 10 minutes, come back at uh, 12, 10, and resume. Is that all right for the members? Yes, Mr. Chairman, with one exception, if I may, I think Mr. Micah has unanimous uh, consent request. My ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Klinger, if he may be recognized we'll, to do we'll recognize him and yield for that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I ask you unanimous consent uh, that questions from uh, Representative uh, Klinger be submitted and also directed uh, appropriately. Right. Without objections? So moved. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Okay, Chairman. We will break for 10 minutes. Come back at 12.10. And just before we go, we've also been joined by Congressman Payne, who's also joined us, too. You didn't vote already, did you? Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, you go to graduate school, and uh, the state hired me after I got out of school, and then I left. Is that right? Uh, raised my kids. There. A lot of people in California just, you know, let's get the California. Well, you know, it's getting kind of rocky. <laughs> I wasn't sure how earthquake things everything was. Let me give you the notes. Okay, I'll wait to hear from you. That'd be great. Okay. I'll see you next week. Sounds good. Thank you. That's exciting. Okay. You know, we have to vote around here, so that was a vote. And of course, when the bells go off, everybody run. Uh, let me begin by asking, I guess, you, uh, uh, Mr. Shepak. Will states and cities like, which well, I just say states and cities, period, which now have a significant financial contribution to servicing the poor, those states that uh, have a large poor population, and uh, will they be compensated under the administration's health care plan? And I think about New York in particular. I'm from New York, and uh, there we spend $50 million in terms of just for prisoners. Uh, the undocumented is 10% of our uh, uninsured clinic patients. And I know you indicated that you've been in contact or had dialogue and that you felt comfortable with the process moving forward. Uh, uh, so I feel comfortable asking you this question. Uh, will, the, will areas like that be protected under this plan? 
Um, you raised a number of issues. First off, the federal government is supposed to pick up all of the additional subsidies for low-income individuals, okay? I don't know what the, I mean, that means that uh, a certain percentage of the population that's uninsured now would be mandated. So if they're in fact working, that they would be picked up. I think the numbers show that that would reduce the uninsured from around 37, 38 million down to about 8 to 10 million. That remaining 8 to 10 million then would be in fact subsidized in some sense by the federal government. So I can't remember what exactly New York's numbers are, but I think they're around 14 to 15 percent uh, are uninsured. And of course some states are as low as 6 percent and some as high as uh, 25 to, to 28 percent. But I think that the federal government would take that responsibility and pay a share for everybody that's up to, I think the poverty is 150 percent of, of poverty. In terms of the undocumented um, aliens, um, I think what they're thinking is that there would be some money available for emergency care, but emergency care only for undocumented. And it's unclear yet whether that would come through uh, some residual of the Medicaid funding or some special block grant or in some, uh, I think they're talking about increasing some of the public health monies. So again, I think there's money available supposedly to go to states uh, to take care of the undocumented, but only for the emergency care. Um, and of course, a lot of states and counties, I think, are in fact funding a lot of additional services, which they would probably be forced to continue. In terms of prisoners, my understanding is that there would not be any uh, additional federal money for that population. Uh, Ms. Todd, uh, you have come from an area that has a tremendous amount of undocumented as well. Yes. So this State must be a concern of yours, too. Well, it is a major concern because the federal policy is nothing that we can influence directly. And we are uh, facing a situation where we have many uh, undocumented aliens who come into our borders in many of our states. And we, as county governments, have the responsibility for providing total health and uh, services to them. And this, this amounts to hundreds of millions of dollars. So uh, that is a concern. And we do believe that the federal government uh, should provide support for the uh, ramifications of a federal policy. Secondly, you alluded to the criminal justice system. In county jails, and counties are primarily responsible for criminal justice, uh, we have three types of prisoners. We have those who have been sentenced and are serving their time, those who are awaiting transfer to state prisons, and then we have those who do not have the financial resources to make bail. They are pre-trial detainees. They do not, they have not under our American system of justice been adjudicated or judged as, as guilty, and they're innocent until proven guilty. And yet the current plan uh, would exclude them from receiving health care, which I personally believe is a constitutional issue. Uh, that needs to be addressed. Currently, it's my understanding they can get uh, some support, but the legislation specifically excludes them. Uh, also, re referencing uh, the, the community providers, there's another concern that we have on the county level. The legislation provides for what they call essential community um, provider status, and that is, that is for those that provide for the underserved. You mentioned the 37 million people. Those, of course, are the ones that the local governments, particularly the counties and some of the larger cities, are providing health care to. Um, the essential community provider status, which will receive the federal funds, are designated by HHS under the legislation. But then further on in the bill, there's, it alludes to uh, exemptions that are made available to uh, health care plans, and it's not specific uh, as to uh, how that will impact us, but we are concerned that if a health care plan could go to, H to the state and require um, a waiver, or request a waiver from dealing with the essential community providers and indeed would create a two-tier system, which is defeating what is the original intent of this legislation to provide equal access and opportunity uh, for all. So that, that needs to be addressed, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. well, thank you very much. Uh, let me ask, um, well, actually any of you, uh, do you have estimates 
on what the cost would be to state and local governments in terms of startup and to administer the administration's health reform bill. How difficult will it be for jurisdictions to come up with the money to implement this proposal? Um, you're right. The administrative and startup costs are fairly significant. I think what's in the administration's bill is that there will be some money going directly to state governments at the time that the federal legislation, in fact, passes. That would be sort of planning money for states. And then once a state, in fact, enacts their legislation that would set up alliances, there is an additional uh, amount of money uh, that would, in fact, come uh, to states. And then, of course, once you triggered onto the system, I think you would, in fact, get the subsidies. But, but you're right. We have not made an estimate of what that cost is, but I think that uh, the plan is aware of that and there is monies available. I, I, don't, I don't believe that issue has been adequately addressed. I know that, uh, that the counties have to pay over $30 billion now from our local resources, which are limited. Uh, many of us face property tax caps and have no additional revenue sources. I hear figures like $700 billion tossed around, and I would urge you for the total program at some point in time. I don't know any more than you do, and, and I would suggest that's something we really need to take a, a look at. I don't um, know that the cigarette tax will be a sufficient amount of money to fund the proposal as it's initially been suggested. Right. I'll only respond, Mr. Chairman. My understanding is that there are no numbers yet available to either the House or Senate budget committees on total costs, much less who's going to bear what share. Uh, we were discussing while you were voting, one of the major issues that will be uh, part of this plan will be how that capital is raised when the plans commence. And there is not yet good information about uh, how that capital will be raised, whether it will come through the municipal finance market, if so, who the issuers, issuers will be, and what the impact on existing municipal finance programs will be. So it's something we'll have to get back to you on. Right. All right. Thank you. Uh, let me just uh, ask this. Uh, um, and I'm not sure who raised it. I think it might have been you, Frank. I'm not sure uh, uh, at this point. You talked about flexibility in, uh, in dealing with, with problems, and you talked about in terms of uh, uh, school equity and a lot of other things that might pop up as we move forward and that uh, the locals should have you know, some flexibility to be able to deal with some of these issues. I don't know, was that you raised that point? Well, I believe probably both President Todd and I raised that issue because it, it's a substantial concern. I know one that Congressman Condit has raised on numerous occasions. Right. Um, here, uh, I raised it early on in the context, depending upon how health care alliances are set up within states, you, do, you are going to have an issue which is comparable to the school issue going on in state after state right now, which is if an alliance is set up, say, to cover just the city of Detroit, but not the suburbs, mm -hmm. you have a huge cost problem because your base will be just the same as the tax base. The base will be exceptionally poor, and yet the service needs will be far higher than they would be in the suburbs. So there's little direction in the plan now how you cross-cut. So uh, there's the potential here to have a duplication of the difficulties that are confronting, I think, Ray, virtually every state in the country about school equity. Uh, and those same issues are clearly going to emerge with regard to health care, depending upon how those alliances are set up in a geographical sense, that is, how they cross borders and deal with the disparity issue. Can I add something very quickly? Uh, a cookie-cutter approach will not really uh, significantly adequately address this. The best uh, suggestion we could give to you would be to look at the existing delivery systems that you have in place and give the flexibility to utilize those delivery systems, involve the communities to a greater extent in monitoring and administering how these programs are put into place because they best know the needs and concerns of their communities and their people. You know, I, I agree with you. We've wasted resources. You know, um, if the enemy is coming across 
one bridge, uh, we do not take our, enemy, take, take our troops to a different bridge. Uh, we go where the problem is. Yes. And I think that quite often that uh, we have not done that. In, in, uh, and I think that somewhere along the line that if we're talking about reform, that we must begin to address the areas that really have the problems. And I'm hoping that uh, this is true reform, because if not, then uh, we're going to end up in worse shape than we are now if mm -hmm. we do not look at the areas where the problems are. If there's an epidemic, and uh, we need to address it. And uh, when I look at the whole undocumented situation, and I just think, suppose there's a crisis of some sort, you know, how do we deal with it? I mean, I think that uh, uh, we need to have the kind of flexibility to be able to go and to deal with it, because the problem that is created sometimes could even make things worse and I think that we have to uh, recognize that so uh, uh, I agree with you let me thank uh, you for your testimony let me yield now to the ranking member of the committee Mr. Schiff thank you Mr. Chairman uh, Mr. Shepak talking about am I pronouncing your name Shepak I'm sorry sir I thought I made a mistake there. Mr. Shepak um, talking about what what experience the states have in the delivery of health care uh, even, even in Hawaii, which I think probably offers the most comprehensive as far as state plans go, I'm not aware of any state that does now or even contemplates being the purchasing agent for health care for nearly all of the citizens of that state as is called for, as I understand it, in the administration's plan. Um, are, there, are there examples of any state government that has that kind of experience? Well, let me, let me say first off that I think the plan allows the state to set up alliances, but the alliances can be a nonprofit, they can be a quasi-government agency, or they can be a government agency. And I think what you'll find in a significant number of states that these will in fact be set up as nonprofit organizations and they will be run by a board and the board will essentially be composed of employers and consumers of health care. So I don't think you should think of state government as actually running the alliances on a day-by-day -day basis, that they will set up these entities to run. I respectfully think that that's a distinction without a difference, because we have a situation where most people are going to be forced to join these alliances, whether they wish to or not, and the alliances will be set up by the state governments and regulated by the state governments, so the state governments are still the responsible party, ultimately, for the purchasing of health care for their citizens. And I know of no experience that state governments have, uh, with due respect to the state employees, uh, to, to that extent on behalf of health care purchasing. Well, let me just say that uh, if you look at who runs health care in this country at this time, uh, the states run uh, with the counties and all that, the Medicaid program, which I think is, in fact, the largest delivery of health services. Uh, second, they, in fact, run their programs for their employees. I think if you add those together, they are right now the largest purchaser uh, of health care uh, directly. Uh, second of all, uh, they do all of the insurance enforcement uh, and all of that regulation. Uh, most of the uh, tort uh, things are in state courts, and that is uh, state law. Um, they're the ones that have done cost control in terms of hospital regulation, such as Maryland and so on. So I think as you look across the levers of policy in health care, I find that most of them, in fact, reside at the, at the state level. Well, since you mentioned employees, and because I was a state employee uh, in New Mexico for more than 12 years, as well as a city, city employee, I might add, in Albuquerque, uh, I, I know that as we have the outline of the administration's health care plan, that federal employees will be required to, to join these regional alliances. Frankly, I'm not sure the federal employees have found that, that one out yet, but uh, I know that's here in Washington. Do you know, speaking for state, county, and municipalities, from what we do know of the administration's plan, is the same compulsion placed on state, county, and city employees? I yes. assume it is. Yes, but everybody is required. All right. The only people... I'm sorry. As I said, the only people that are out of the regional alliance are those firms of 5,000. Right. There, there, there are a couple of exceptions, right? And, in, and even those, I think, are, have tax consequences if they go that way, adversely. But let me ask this question. As representatives here today of state, county, and municipal employees, has there been any poll taken that you know of, of state, county, or municipal employees saying, do you want to give up? your current program to be forced into this new regional alliance? Has anyone asked them? We, we haven't really done any specific poll, um, but I think where the governors are 
is that if you're going to make alliances work and you're going to have the Medicaid population in, small business in, you need to have uh, other uh, state and local employees in. Well, in the sense I'm raising this question, the governors are 50 employees. I'm wondering about all the other thousands of state employees. If anyone's asked them yet, do you desire to be compelled to give up your existing choice of benefits as, under the state as an employer and compelled to join these brand new regional alliances? Has anyone asked them yet? yet? Do you, I, I, you know? Perhaps the, the question is premature because we still don't know what's going to come out of Congress. You know, uh, we're, we're working at this point as counties to ensure that as much flexibility and it, as possible is involved and that we as county providers, because that's the other part, and you have very, you know, well addressed that, uh, that not only do we serve the underinsured, but we employ uh, thousands of people ourselves, and we're employers, and we want to have the same assurances that, that we can provide for our employees. In my county, for example, in Pinellas County, uh, we provide uh, insurance, and we go out and actively solicit proposals from different groups and then we offer this to our employees and we would like to have the flexibility and the ability to do the same. Mr. Sheffer, yeah. uh, I think you Congressman there are two questions here. Uh, first, I noticed that in our survey which we brought up this morning that the single largest factor affecting uh, local budgets last year was the cost of employee health care benefits. So from the employer side, there is deep concern about the existing situation. But how it cuts across city lines will be very different. In New Mexico, uh, there are a lot of the smallest communities that provide virtually no benefits to the employees. So in those cases, the municipal employees will say, hey, getting something that guarantees us access is far better than what we have now. I would suspect in Albuquerque, uh, where the benefits would stand a good chance of being less than they receive now, the answer might be different. So I think any survey is going to show a wide variety, and I assume AFSME will make its views known to you and to all of us as we get more details of this plan. Well, Ms. Todd makes a very good point that we are evaluating a plan that does not exist yet in terms of a specific bill introduced in the Congress. We've had a great deal of public commentary and testifying before Congress on conceptual ideas. Uh, but I would respectfully, I have another item I want to ask about, but I would just respectfully suggest, and I would agree, Mr. Mr. Schaffer, am I pronouncing your name yes, sir. correctly? That there would be difference of opinion. I mean, uh, uh, I'm sure all federal employees don't agree, so one can assume honest differences of opinion of, of other citizens, whether no matter who they work for. But I would just like to respectfully plant uh, as a suggestion to your organizations uh, the idea of some type of polling of, of, of your uh, state, county, and city employees as employees and to see what their preferences would be. I would be interested in knowing that. I'd be interested in knowing what the federal employees think, once they, like I say, once they find it out. I don't think they have yet. I, the other area I want to ask about is unfunded mandates. Ms. Todd, you spoke several times rather emphatically in opposition to unfunded mandates uh, as, as a general concept. Conception, uh, Mr. Shapak for the governors uh, and uh, Mr. Shafferth for the cities. Um, do you agree in your your opposition to, or at least questioning of, of uh, unfunded federal mandates? Do we agree? Well, I, I, you 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 uh, several times, Ms. Todd, already spoke on that. Okay, and spoke, so you know. How I uh, yeah, feel. you made yourself <laughs> clear, but uh, especially complimenting the bill that would that would limit them. I'm wondering if your if your fellow witnesses on behalf of their organizations agree with that. Yes, basically we do. I mean, mandates have been a significant problem for states. Um, I think our primary problems are in the Medicaid area. Uh, it, it has uh, contributed to just phenomenal explosive growth. Um, we, as I mentioned before, we've had two states that now do compre have done a comprehensive. Uh, analyses of the impact. I think what you'll find for states, it's 80 percent is Medicaid and 20 percent is education, environment, and so on. I suspect that's probably a flip for local government where I think they get more impact. And that's, by be the that's because side. of the federal government mandates as to what must be covered under Medicaid? It's benefits and eligibility <coughs> primarily, but these are cumulative. Uh, Mr. Schaffer, uh, what, what's the opinion of mis municipalities on that? Well, actually, our members last year at our annual meeting uh, uh, adopted a resolution supporting Congressman Condit's legislation on unfunded mandates. Uh, 
This group here worked last year just on the subject of Medicaid mandates uh, and reached, uh, we spent a year working on, this, on the topic. I know President Todd participated in that. You're helping. in support of Congressman Condit's bill, I assume. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, just a couple more things on this, and I thank the Chair for the generosity of the time. Briefly, in the administration plan as we see it, do you see unfunded mandates being imposed on your respective areas of government that you're concerned about, or do you believe uh, that the federal government will, will pay for whatever it requires you to do? Has there been any analysis done yet uh, of that? Yes, sir. Ms. Todd? We've done an analysis, and again, I would reference what uh, you and your colleagues have mentioned as a concern. The undocumented aliens are specifically excluded, and it is the mandated responsibility of county governments to handle that issue. Secondly, those of us who are responsible for... Is that, the in, the, is that in the plan? Because yes. I, I didn't see... Okay. Yes, it is. Thank you. Uh, also specifically excluded in the, the proposed plan are the uh, jail population. And as I referenced earlier, that also includes pretrial detainees who are innocent until judged guilty. Uh, there are, it is, it is ambiguous to us exactly as to what our role will be in the whole situation. So uh, we are concerned about that. We have done an analysis and we will, of course, continue to closely but monitor it. it. it but yes, we're mandated. Well, in what might be, say, in fairness to the administration, isn't the current responsibility for those groups already with the county governments, largely? Uh, currently, we receive some funds. Uh, for the jail population uh, from insurance plans or Medicaid. And currently, uh, we receive some supplemental, not sufficient, but there have been appropriations to deal with undocumented immigrants. Any other analysis either from Just, just let me say that what we're, we have brought in state budget officers to work on this, and we are working very hard to do a consistent state-by-state -state impact, and we'll probably have that done in a month to, to six weeks. It is very complicated, however, because there is a significant number of savings, both to local government and to state government in this plan. I mean, for example, the federal government is going to be picking up all of the care for low-income individuals for a basic benefit package, so there is going to be a windfall now for local government that have been picking it up, as well as for states. On the other hand, there is some new programs. For example, there's a new low, low uh, uh, long-term care program. And how this nets out is pretty complicated because there's eight or ten major uh, impacts. And I just think it's going to take time. One, one final thing. And this is, uh, this is about an un proposed unfunded mandate, but not in health care. So I, if you wish to answer now, uh, I would extend you the time. If not, uh, if you need to research this, I'd just ask if you would get back to me. Um, I'm also on the Judiciary Committee. Being there is why I was a little late this, uh, this, this uh, afternoon. And um, uh, the Brady Bill, as currently written, uh, calls for, I think it's a five-day waiting period, with a mandate that the local county sheriff or the local chief of police shall do a background check. In other words, uh, this bill does not mandate a federal law enforcement agency to do a check. It mandates the local law enforcement agency to do the check. And it does not propose any funding for doing the check. And uh, I wonder if, if your organizations have a position uh, on that bill as an unfunded mandate. And, and if so, if you could just provide it to me, I would be grateful. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I yield back. Thank you. I yield time to Mr. Condit of California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Monday, I met with the uh, National Conference of Mayors and representatives from your groups as well, and they have uh, commissioned a, a study that hopefully will be finished in a short period of time about the cost of unfunded mandates, which I think is essential for us to have a meritorious case as we move along to Congress. And, and all I would uh, encourage uh, you to do everything you can for us to get good numbers. That's basically what we have to have, I believe, to, to um, prove our point. Uh, in asking that, uh, I know Ms. Todd and I know her commitment to this. The other two witnesses, is this the number one priority for your legislative priority for your association or groups? It's, it's near the top for us. I mean, I think health care reform uh, is probably our number one. Okay. Uh, dealing with public safety is our number one priority, but this is in the top five. Uh, there, ha there are several proposals in Congress about how to deal with unfunded mandates. Um, 
One would be to allow waivers. That simply mean if you don't have the money or the wherewithal to do the legislation, you get a waiver, you have to go before a, a body, a commission, or some group of people and ask for a waiver. Is that enough for you, or, or do you think there just ought to be a flat stop to unfunded mandates to local governments? I think you should first of all have a fiscal note for every, everything that comes through and analyze what the cost of it is. If you go shopping for something, you want to know what the cost is and that you have adequate money in the bank. So it makes perfect sense to me that that should be the first thing that you should do. And secondly, I think that if there's a cost, it's a national priority that the federal government should fund it. The other two witnesses. Yeah, our, our sense is that that's probably not enough. I mean, it's also hard to stop all mandates. I mean, our association at times has, in fact, uh, recommended some mandates, uh, particularly like in the Family Assistance uh, right. Act. Uh, so I think one of the things we're very interested in is a very serious consultation uh, process that we can talk about it very, very early on and that we have good information on the impact and that the Congress really only do it when it's sort of a consensus that this needs to be done and it's a high priority, which is a, is a long shot from what's happening now. I think that's right. I think one of the outcomes of our study on Medicaid last year was uh, there have been proposals in the Congress to simply put a federal cap on Medicaid to not relieve the responsibility of states and local governments of providing federally mandated services to citizens, but would alleviate the cost to the federal government. We understand that's a cost that's already there and is going to be there somehow. And the issue more is to make sure there's a consultation process so everyone's at the table. There's full disclosure of cost-benefit analysis, or risk analysis, so everyone understands who's being required to do what, why they're being required to pay for it, where the possible revenue sources are. Uh, I would say, while we are strongly supportive of your legislation and others, clearly at the same time we are deeply interested and have made our first priority with regard to unfunded mandates day a demonstration by the Congress that those requirements under the Safe Drinking Water Act and the stormwater provisions are reduced and they're reduced before this first session of Congress leaves so that because right now there's there's no city in this country that does not want to make sure that the drinking water is safe in their community there is a huge understanding that there are provisions in the current law and regulations that go that have no relationship to reducing risk or reducing costs well which brings up uh, Ms. Todd mentioned uh, October the 27th uh, I, I just want to let you know that we here in Congress uh, the uh, unfunded mandate caucus intends to participate October the 27th. We have reserved two hours of time for special orders to talk about unfunded mandates. We also will be doing a news conference, a joint news conference with the 67 members of that caucus, and we hope to help educate our colleagues as well as the nation on unfunded mandates. And I do appreciate you being here today. I appreciate you know, your kindness with your answers. Mr. Chairman, I, I appreciate your tolerance of me. I'm not a member of this subcommittee. And uh, you invited me, and I hope you'll invite me back again. Uh, I appreciate very much you letting me be here. It's a pleasure to have you. Let me say we really appreciate your leadership in this area. You've been in the forefront. And uh, I think it's impeccable. Right. I tell you. And, uh, let me just say, by closing by, this hearing has raised critical questions about the fairness of the administration's health care and welfare reform proposals, especially for those states and local governments we have significant numbers of poor residents. Let me go on record now saying that fairness and equality must be the cornerstone of any acceptable plan. We must also eliminate second class health care for urban and rural areas. We do not need a two tiered system. It is my intention to raise many of the concerns expressed at this hearing with the administration before the health and welfare reform legislation is introduced in the Congress. And I'd like to say I look forward to working with the administration and I also look forward to working with my colleagues on this subcommittee to find workable solutions to these difficult <coughs> and complex issues. But I think that we have the capacity and the ability to do it and if we're really going to reform health care and welfare it's going to require that kind of cooperation. So let me thank the members of the committee for their 
testimony. You have been extremely helpful, and we look forward to talking with you further as the process continues to move. This hearing is adjourned. This hearing was convened to discuss how states and localities could afford to implement health care and welfare reform. Coming next, the Congressional Hispanic Caucus holds a news conference to discuss the president's health care plan. Monday, our American profiles continue as two members of the fourth estate discuss their lives and careers.